the Exurb Ad Astra podcast, episode 7, with writer Max Gladstone talking about how writing is like fencing, part 2, continued straight on from the previous episode. So jumping, because this is a fun jumping around, I noticed we never even got to the second or third oh, comparison gotcha. <laughs> to fencing. No, you never did yours. Yeah, well, I'll do mine of it. But but the, the Disneyland thing is just a very interesting thing in terms of yes. the construction of narrative layered over the space and how it changed interaction. So one of the less widely known elements of my long interaction with nerddom is that I was staffed for 15 years at Anime Boston. As the convention grew from a couple thousand people to an over 20,000 person convention. And I rapidly settled into having the role of running the costume events that weren't the main costume contest. Uh, And every year we would create new events and activities that were, let's give this a try as a thing people can do. Because at that type of convention, about 40% of the people are there in costume. And it was interesting creating new things. Some of them were big events, like a human chess match. But a couple of the ones that we created exactly mimic what, Max, you just described happening at Disney. So one of the ones that we made was incredibly easy to run, but everyone always asked for and loved was a cosplay photo scavenger hunt uh, or a cosplay signature scavenger hunt where you were supposed to go around the convention and look for people meeting certain criteria on a sheet. And once you got all the signatures, you would get a ribbon. And it wasn't look for this specific character. It was find a character who is more than a thousand years old. Find a character who has a weapon that is longer than you are tall. (laughs) Find a character who has come back from the dead twice. Yeah, you know, uh, find a character who is a vice president. That's great. And it was, people loved it because it required ingenuity. And it also meant you had a, if you were a newcomer to the convention or, or not with a friend group, you had a thing to talk to other people about. Uh, and you'd come up to people and say, hey, can you help me think of a character that someone might be cosplaying that has blah attribute? And it would become a conversation starter for things. But it's very parallel to the looking for the hidden codes for the Jack Sparrow hunt of you are engaged in this thing where you are trying to find somebody who is a thousand years old and hunting around for them uh, and talking to others and, and gathering, oh, I saw, you know, somebody just go around the corner who was, who was the creator of the universe in, in, <laughs> in their universe. You should run after them. They have giant pink hair, you know. Creator of the universe, go. And it was exactly that kind of thing layered onto the space. And then similarly to the giant magic duel thing, there was a game of amazing duration called Catch the Barrel. And this was inspired by the season of Naruto in which one of the characters was in a magic barrel and the entire season was the other characters fighting over the magic barrel and trying to get a hold of the magic barrel. So we made this magic barrel out of a bucket and we put sheets on the outside and you could be on Team Ninja or Team... And it was a different team, the rivalry. It was usually pirates versus ninjas versus Shinigami death spirits um, because of which series were popular being cosplayed at the time, which really boils down to Naruto versus Bleach versus One Piece. Uh, And you could find someone who had the barrel and challenge them to rock, paper, scissors. (laughs) And then the victor keeps the barrel. Oh. And then someone else can challenge them. And the team that takes the barrel the most... Every time you take it, you put a tally mark on the side for your team. And then the winning team at the end of the convention at Cosplay Chess is announced. And then it has some plot effect on uh, what happens at Cosplay Chess, usually giving one side or the other a MacGuffin weapon. But boy, did people love that and like show up at, you know, seven in the morning, ask on the first day of the convention, asking if it was if the barrel was out yet and 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 ask if you've seen the barrel around here and then find the barrel abandoned in places sometimes and take it and, and re- return it to the staff so that you can launch the barrel anew. Um, and it was so simple. It was just a slightly organized method for challenging people to rock, paper, scissors. But it created teams and it created camaraderie and, and, and working together. And it layered on top of the space in a way that did use a minuscule amount of narrative and indeed a minuscule amount of writing because 
once you put the barrel out into this convention center full of 20,000 people, they don't know anything about it necessarily. And Mm -hmm. uh, you just have to have explanatory text on the side of the barrel (laughs) with tape (laughs) that explains what this is in a way that isn't interesting enough to get somebody's enthusiasm up for it. That's so great, though. It had exactly the same narrative effect that you're describing in the much more professionalized Disney context of creating natural interaction spaces. And in the case of cosplay, moments at which you can also role play Mm. and and respond as your character would respond if challenged to a duel by a random pirate. And large cons can be so um, disorienting and overwhelming. Um, Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever actually been to Anime Boston, which is a real shame. But when I end up at larger cons, like the kind of things that take place in like an airplane hangar or some enormous convention center, Mm -hmm. I will often experience, you know, the sort of initial sugar rush of how much stuff is there. And then this profound existential crash of like, I don't know, overexposure to consumerism. There's a giant media tower. What am I doing here? How does all of this fit. And something like what you're describing becomes this way to refocus the human beings who are excited about gaming or costuming or the specific shows enough to show up in costume and Mm -hmm. spend a lot of time working on, or maybe not even a lot of time working on their costumes. And uh, all of a sudden they become the center event as opposed to exhibitors or the sort of larger context in which the media is produced. I've often thought that having some kind of structure, which could be the barrel team thing or the things that you're describing but having some kind of structure that is the thing that you're doing helps you cope with overwhelming things right i used to have a thing when i went into great big enormous unfamiliar art museums where i would go to see three things And I would decide ahead of time the the three things that I was going to see. And I mean, of course, I'd see a lot of other things on the way, Mm -hmm. but I could do that on my own and comfortably without becoming completely overwhelmed with the idea that you've got to see every single thing in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. (laughs) Yeah. In one day. <laughs> I love games for navigating museums in this way. Um, playing Spot the Saint with you guys throughout Italy. Yes. Is, it, it's a wonderful way, especially for, as somebody who doesn't, uh, had not previously felt a great deal of emotional connection or interest in medieval art before things start to feel representational in a way that's like, oh, yes, I can tell that looks like a person. Massive oversimplification there, of course, but but it was like, oh, this is a gate. This is an entrance point into this thing. It's something to anchor. Or in my friend Kendrick Ton, who's a visual artist, portrait painter, sort of academic style, mentioned to me idly while we were wandering through, uh, I think it might have even been the Gardner in Boston, that... Uh, It's fun sometimes wandering through, especially uh, sort of academic inflected, like very portrait heavy um, or in landscape art to play spot the red dot because, Hmm. well, skies are blue and grass is green and shadows are often blue-ish because the sky is blue. So generally, if you're looking to anchor the color space in a composition, very easy thing for anybody, any painter to do is put a giant red dot somewhere (laughs) on the frame and that will naturally anchor the eye so it could be an apple it could be a red highlight on somebody's arm it could be hair it could be a hat but all of a sudden it's like oh yes that is a very pretty painting i'm overwhelmed and have no point of access to this like oh that's a red dot right red dot i understand (laughs) and spot the saint also does that Mm -hmm. yeah so briefly spot the saint is when you go into a collection of medieval renaissance art and you're working on recognizing the saints that are there standing on either side of the crucifixion or standing next to the Virgin Mary and you learn to recognize them because they hold characteristic things so that uh, John the Baptist has his hair shirt and San Lorenzo has the grill he was grilled to death on and St. Catherine has the Catherine wheel and so on and so you have a thing that you're looking for within these quite different but also quite repetitive works of art. You wouldn't believe how happy I was when I learned to recognise Anthony Abbott. <laughs> it's so hard! <laughs> uh, Anthony Abbott is really the joker of the pack of cards. Uh. <laughs> no, it's Sensonomius who's the joker. Yes. But I had uh, a game like that that my son and I made up where you look in a portrait gallery where you ask the question, bribable or not bribable? <laughs> because it, it gives gives you a narrative way to access the paintings. Mm. 
and you almost never see one where you can't actually answer bribable or not bribable. <laughs> and when you do, it makes that one extra interesting as well. Yes, exactly. It makes that one really fascinating. Or if you disagree, this is if you're with another person and you disagree, and you're like, well, there's certain circumstances in which they'd be bribable, which leads you into sort of making up stories about the people whose faces you're looking up, which is also fun. I think we think and talk a lot about how narrative helps us remember information and helps us structure information, how much easier it is to remember an event or a year or a historical detail because it was in a narrative, in a story that you were reading, or it was presented to you in a narrative way rather than just as a raw fact. But I think narrative is also a tool we use to access things live and in the now uh, so that we have a question to be asking of it which can be what is the visual cue that is anchoring this. It can be which saint is that. It can be is this costume going to fulfill my scavenger hunt list thing. It can be what fabrics are the Virgin Mary sitting on and wearing. Hmm. Uh, and then you notice moments of like, wow, this painting, this painting is about those sleeves <laughs> that Isabella de Este is wearing. And Isabella de Este is definitely a, an afterthought in this painting. This painting is about <laughs> those amazing sleeves. And it's very much like this panel of Ghosts in the Shell manga is about the motorcycle and not about whether they're saving the president or not. And then you can think about the different circumstances that created that. What leads to a painting where the focus on these sleeves is so overwhelming? What leads to a bubble when the focus on this bit of tech is so central? And that connects to human choices. And I've also found that if I go to an art gallery that I know with a new person, sometimes they'll bring a new way of looking at it. So, for instance, if I'd gone with Kendrick and he'd done the red spot thing, that would be a new way of looking at art that I already know. Mm -hmm. Because I know when I first started going to the Uffizi with Ada and we started doing Spot the Saint, that was a whole opening up of it. But I was in the Uffizi a couple of years ago with a friend who is working on the influence of Indian and Islamic fabrics in Renaissance art. And suddenly, once she'd pointed this out, I started seeing those everywhere and I was doing that. All of those are very interesting to think about when narrative is moving us through a space. Because again, these are all tools also for navigating a space in which, like the museum exhibit and the Choose Your Own Adventure game, you have imperfect control over the creator of the space has imperfect control over the order of motion of the experiencer of the space. Or the joy of the creation is in giving the uh, reader, player, party the opportunity to navigate a space and seeing what happens. Well, and I was then thinking about, so one important principle of museum design, which I remember first hearing from John Shearman, a, a brilliant Raphael scholar, uh, is that a number of people who are very serious about museum design insists that it's very valuable in the midst of a major museum to have a room with none of the thing that you're there to see. Like you're in an art gallery and then there's a room with windows, couches, flower arrangements, mirrors, and no art. And, and, and you can take a break for a moment and look at something totally different. Or if it's a science museum, right, there's a room with couches and windows and, and a flower arrangement and no science hmm. for a moment. And people will linger in that room for an amount of time proportional to sort of how mo mentally exhausted they are by the work of looking at the thing uh, before moving on. But it really does substantially increase your mental museum stamina to have even just a 30 second or a minute break in that moment of I'm no longer looking at whatever it is that I'm here to analyze. I'm now exercising different parts of my brain, which is comparable in some ways to the moments when you realize I've just had some big, intense stuff all in a row for my reader. You know what the reader really wants next is like a, a giggly Miyazaki bathing scene. <laughs> you know, or, or everybody trying to get sandwiches and being unsuccessful in ways that are comedic and endearing. Uh, or a, a scene that has substance in it, but that has a kind of a lightness and a kind of mundanity and a kind of a relaxation that the intensity of that climax didn't. Which I think of sometimes when structuring a, an outline as the 
And then the room that doesn't have any art in the art gallery, which can also then be the moment for the potatoes or the pie with the crust that cracks or the other piece of inclusion or detail that didn't fit in moments when you needed the narrative to be flowing fast and and have tension, but fits in the moment where what you're giving the reader is the opposite of tension for a little while. That's a really good point and does connect back actually to the other thing that sprang to mind when Joe mentioned connections between fencing or sword work. And um, so the sword play connection was in the context of developing action. When you are on a fencing strip as a novice or somebody who's seen a lot of Errol Flynn movies, the instinct is, well, I have this sword-like thing and the pointy end needs to go into the other person. And the way to do that is to move as quickly as possible and do everything as fast as possible to get the pointy end into the other person. And this is a good strategy in the way that like reuse fireball, the, the Hadoken and Street Fighter is a good strategy. That is to say, it's something very obvious that you can wrap your head around really quickly. But it's if you uh, try to do that beyond an opening level of play, you will rapidly run into serious problems. <laughs> the challenge is if you try to do everything as quickly as possible with maximum speed and intensity, other people don't have the time that they need to react. And often what you are trying to do to set up an action or an attack, say, is uh, to get people to react in a way that you can predict. If you parry as quickly as possible and then disengage the expected repost as quickly as possible and then counterattack all of these things as quickly as possible, the odds are that you will, for one thing, not actually complete any particular action before moving on to the next action. So it'll all just be a kind of muddy uh, mess. But also that you will do all of these three actions so very, very quickly that the other party will not have the opportunity to disengage around your parry to make the expected counterattack, which then you can beat and attack onto their arm. So like a feint needs to be sold in the same way that a piece of sleight of hand needs to be sold. You extend, not so slowly that the other person doesn't respond, but you extend in a very obvious marked way and sometimes you need to feel like you're moving in extreme slow motion to get the other person to believe the feint enough to make the parry motion, which moves their blade even slightly off of your target area. And then once they do that and their blade is no longer pointed at your chest, you can disengage, just dip your blade around theirs and move in for a counterattack. But if you do not sell that feint, they won't believe it enough to make the parry and then you will have nothing to disengage and their blade will still be pointed right at your chest when you run in. And the writing connection here and the connection to the room uh, that doesn't have any visible art or science in it is that the reader needs to have space to respond and the characters need to have space to respond to the things that are happening in the scene and to the things that have just happened. This also connects to my mind to um, the thread in our conversation between the, uh, of the differences between prose fiction and stage play, cinema, manga. Like you need in because you don't have an actor there visible on stage or screen responding to events with their face, their body language, the subtle transformations that anyone makes when like an explosion happens nearby or somebody is crying. You don't have that. So you need to give that to the reader with description, long or short. You need to make the reader feel those emotions or let the reader know that the character is actually feeling those emotions in a way that, uh, you know, at least I, I often find not exactly unintuitive, but, uh, you know, it, it's something I need to remind myself to do. The reader doesn't necessarily know what emotion the character is experiencing, even though I do. Though I think this is also sort of a modernist tick, like a post-Hemingway, post-Carver tick, to bring up Joe's earlier point, the tendency to sort of swallow emotions and, and affect into a narrative. But the reader definitely needs time to process them, whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And I mean, this is, this is a pacing thing. I call this Here's to Valhalla. <laughs> Not after the song Here's to Valhalla in Ada's Sundown Cycle, but after the need for the song Here's to Valhalla mm-hmm. because it breaks up two very intense duets with a cheerful Viking drinking song. <laughs> and if you imagine the the confrontation of Valjean, Javert, angry men yelling at each other piece from Les Mis, 
these two duets are like that for eight straight minutes each. And you have two sets of lyrics going on and they're extremely emotionally intensive. And so breaking it up with one of the only pieces in the thing where there's only one set of lyrics going on at any given time gets you to be in the mood and ready for the next piece. Whereas if you skip that and do the two intensive ones back to back, it can be overwhelming. And Wagner does this too um, in, in Rheingold, to speak of Here's to Valhalla. Um, <laughs> yes. Rheingold opens with the Rhine Maidens, with Albrecht the Nibelung stealing the gold from the Rhine Maidens. Very traumatic scene, if got across effectively on stage. Really horrifying. And then the immediate next narrative thing that happens is the giants abducting Freya, which is also terrifying and disruptive, and, and a bunch of people shouting at each other, and the horrible things happen on stage. And the intermediary section is a beautiful, um, thrilling zoom pan accomplished by orchestra up from the depths of the, of the Rhine through the Nibelung's forge world up into the heavens. And then we get one of, you know, it's, it's, pompous, it's overbearing, but it's huge and glorious and majestic and wonderful, this Valhalla motif that is Wotan's dream of Valhalla being realized. It's this gorgeous castle of the gods, untainted and everything. And of course, the whole opera cycle is about problematizing this image and messing with this motive, but it's a gorgeous moment. And it's Wotan dreaming on a hillside and his wife comes to wake him up. And then we get into the giant argument, mm -hmm. but you get that moment of beauty and of rest there between the two things. Another example from a theatrical staging thing that I know Joe and I are very familiar with that, we, that I think about in terms of this, this also has to do with starting, when you want there to be a ramping up, you have to set your baseline mm. and then you need to be able to ramp up from that. And one of the most magnificent instances of this I've ever seen is in the Jane Howell, Henry the Sixth. Uh, and Richard III sequence from the BBC Shakespeare Project produced in 1981 and 1982. And if you're doing all four of these plays, you know, setting aside the fact that it's Shakespeare, just imagining this as a, as a director who's about to do a TV series, if you're doing all four of these plays, you're doing 32 battles. And that can get monotonous. You have to make the reader interested in having 32 battles. And this is going to happen over the course of 14 hours of material, and each battle is going to be probably fairly short. But there are a lot of them, and you have to communicate the idea of them getting worse, uh, of it ramping up, of the violence getting worse, and sometimes having peaks, but particularly getting, getting worse, because this is the you know small wars and small civil strifes giving way to larger ones and larger ones and larger ones. Uh, and also it's the BBC and she has no budget. <laughs> so the way she does this is that the first battle, which is the factions of the Duke of Gloucester and the Bishop of Winchester, he's not a cardinal yet at that point, is they come out on pretend horses, right? <laughs> that that are strapped around the actor and, and they you know hold the reins, but it's obviously the kind of pretend horsey on a stick and it's got cloth around it to give the body of the horse. They're very good pretend horses, but the actors are standing there, you know, bouncing with their own bodies. And the actors are brilliant and do a really good job making the horses move in a way that really feels like a horse. But it means that you snicker when the battle begins, and it's just so much like a play battle. And this resonates with the set, which is a giant jungle gym. It's a giant playground-y, jungle gym-y thing of a play castle, and it's all painted bright colors, yellow and pink and red and blue. And, you know, and then the next battle is France, and, and the English and French are fighting each other in Orléans, and they're running around the play castle, and it's really silly, and they're defeating each other, and it feels very much like kids at a play castle. Oh, but then there's a little bit of blood on somebody's nose when he gets punched. Mm. And then the next battle has a little more blood. And the next battle has a little more blood. And as it advances, each battle is worse and more serious until there's blood smeared all over this set because they don't clean it. And so the scars of the past battles and the smearing of the smoke is still there. And because the first battle was so silly and the second battle was also almost silly, she has a huge space in which to ramp up to the final battle so that the difference between those first battles and the horrible, horrible destructiveness of the late battles is incredibly emotionally palpable. 
far more so than when you watch the recent BBC version of the same thing, where they had a big budget and they had soldiers and they had armor and all the battles look pretty similar to each other. Uh, yeah. And the only difference between them is who dies in them. Uh, because they wanted to give all the, the battles their full production battle budget and make them all look cool. And it meant that there wasn't room for ramping up. And I sometimes think about that when I'm planning a very tense chapter. And I'll realize, you know what I need to do in this chapter, which is going to ramp up into the stratosphere in terms of tension by the end? They're going to start this chapter by quietly having breakfast <laughs> and talking to each other about the factions and what might be going to happen and having that little bit of nervousness, but also just interacting with each other as they open their delivery breakfast and see what's inside. Because that is the equivalent of Jane Howell starting that first battle with the bouncy horses. Nothing is as relaxing as breakfast. Yes. Breakfast is the meal we use to, like, reinforce the day feeling normal. And even if you don't have breakfast, there's something you do. You have a glass of water, you have a cup of coffee. There's a thing that, like, okay, the world is normal now. The day is beginning. And if you employ that at the start, it's the maximum sort of relax, take a breath, Okay, and it gives you then this huge space in which to swoop up in the tension. Whereas if you begin with the battle, mm -hmm. you don't have space for that increase in tension. There's also an element of this exact thing in the um, technical complexity with which the narrative is being conveyed or the invention. What I think in prose you would talk about is the invention of the language, maybe the difficulty or the purpleness of, of the language. But in, um, in film, you could also talk about complicated camera work. Uh, the, the example that's really springing to mind because we just finished watching it is Alex Hirsch and et al.'s really wonderful um, animated series, Gravity Falls, which my wife and I just watched over the course of the last couple of weeks. And it's wonderful and has such a powerful emotional gut punch ending. It, it, like one of those few stories that I can point to where things really do come together and resolve in this bang, 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 like the arcs land. And it's, it's great. But the thing that's specifically fascinating to me is how it uses animation in this context. The overall universe of Gravity Falls, for those of you not familiar, is a kind of Twin Peaksy, like weird town in the woods in Oregon where strange stuff is happening all the time. There are, you know, monsters in the forest. There's a time traveler who shows up for an episode. There are gnomes. You'll occasionally see like a giant bug in the background, like the size of all of the trees scuttling away, and it will not really ever be explained until, you know, two seasons later it is. So it's that kind of show. There's a strangeness to the texture of everything. But it's masterful in its use of how strange and how unsettling things are on the level of animation alone. In the early episodes, animated forms on the screen are relatively conservative and stable. You know, a, a sort of mysterious threat that our characters are facing might be a sea serpent, and the sea serpent might be suddenly arising out of a lake. Um, I guess it's a lake serpent in that case. Suddenly arising, or might be a shadow underneath the water. But the sort of outline of the serpent is represented as this consistent, it's, it's a consistent object over time. And you know, time works in a normal way. Substances exist and characters more or less hold their form. And then towards the end of the first season, as the season progresses, you'll see like moments where, oh, wait, that thing sort of turned inside out or that shape, which was a concrete sort of arch, got wiggly for a second there in this way that felt very uncomfortable, but is absolutely an animation thing. It's that like sort of rubber hose animation. There's a moment uh, toward the end of the first season where a new character is introduced. And this is a uh, sort of vaguely demonic personage. We don't know anything about them, and uh, they've been summoned by the antagonist of the first season who wants, you know, something that the antagonist wants, like a deed to a house or something. Very, very normal, right? And this character shows up, and they are a two-dimensional triangle in a world that is two-dimensional, but this is an actual two-dimensional triangle. You know, as the camera moves around, it's always flat, and the two-dimensional triangle says, hey, kid, wonderful, thanks for summoning me. Here, have some deer teeth. 
and there's a deer walking by and everything goes grayscale. The deer opens its mouth and all of its teeth fly out <laughs> and lands in the kid's hands. And the kid is looking at these deer teeth with utter horror. And the triangle says, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. Don't worry about that. Bad first impression. Let me reset. And the animation sequence exactly reverses mm. and the deer wanders off. And it, it continues from there. There's this slow ramping up of what animation can do to destabilize form, to destabilize time, to destabilize like the consistency of character that's in constant tension with the series attention to detail and, and like love of careful, consistent, dramatic character development. So like in style, I guess is what I'm trying to say, whether it's cinematic or animated style or raw prose style, it also really helps to have this baseline established that you can build from. Right. Because if the character designs had begun by being all weird and surrealist character designs, then there's not as much of a space to ramp up. That's exactly it, yes. It's something that I'm really trying to take to heart. I'm always trying to sort of take my toolkit apart and see, you know, what, what can be improved or how can I take it. I, I think there's this tendency in prose sometimes to try to show off everything early on. I've definitely fallen into this uh, sand pit myself. But the challenge is that then you've established a baseline that's so high that maybe some people will engage with it and be super excited about it. But they, the baseline is so high that where do you go up from there? Even Book of the New Sun starts with a very relatable and comprehensible sequence of some kids breaking into a graveyard at night. <laughs> Sometimes you get short story writers who write absolutely brilliant short stories where it is all at a very high pitch and it is incredibly intense and it's really brilliant. And then often when they try to write novels, they try to do novels like that and it doesn't work mm. Mm -hmm. because that's one of the things that's different. You, you can have a little short piece that is all at that level of intensity, but when you write a novel, you've got to be Jane Howell burning your set down <laughs> Yeah, right. in order to get to the end of Richard III. You see that in people like William Tenner for Bester when you know that they did all this intense manic intensity short work before you then look at what does this do at novel length, what works, what methods were made to make it work, where are the moments where it doesn't quite. Mm -hmm. Bester's a perfect example. And, you know, Stars of Destination is itself a very manic book, <laughs> but it does both use methods to make it flow that he has to adopt that he's never used in his short stuff and also have moments at which the media can be overwhelming and, like, good thing it's not twice as long. I also think that the reason Stars My Destination works as a novel, mm -hmm. which none of Best's other novels really work for me, but I think it's because he had Count of Monte Cristo. Mm -hmm. So he could lean on the pacing of Count of Monte Cristo and then change it at the end in that brilliant, brilliant, brilliant way. But because he could lean on the pacing of the Count of Monte Cristo and all of the skills that he already had, he has the uh, Hirst of Valhalla moments that are in Count of Monte Cristo. Yes. And I think that's the problem with all of his other long-form work, where he's trying to pace it himself. And it's constantly manic and it doesn't have that. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Because, and I mean, you know, not to spoil the Count of Monte Cristo, but <laughs> a key to that sequence is that you've introduced your initial character Characters and then the you know the terrible betrayal happens and then there's a time jump and after the time jump you're then reintroducing the characters also introducing new, some new characters but the the moment of introducing characters is a moment when you pause and when it's not as frantic even in a short story writer there will often be it's not quite manic in the moment we're establishing these people and it might only be two or three paragraphs but it isn't and so the fact that there's a time jump gets Bester to decelerate to do the reintroductions of these characters now that they've changed over time and the introductions of the part two time jump forward characters. So, you know, that is a concrete example of what the fact that he's borrowed the pacing of Count of Monte Cristo gets him to then do is have that as a, that's a breather moment. That's a moment in which the tension devamped a bit and then vamps up again uh, in a way that, yeah, Demolished Man never pauses. 
I learned a lot about pacing when I stole the plot of Anthony Trollope's Framley Parsonage for Tooth and Claw. Mm. Mm. Because, I mean, I was doing other things, but I was basically needing the pacing, the ups and downs of Framley Parsonage, and sort of asking why Trollope masterfully made those choices and did those things in the pacing taught me a heck of a lot about pacing and genre and all of those things. It was a neat thing to do. It's a, it's a thing I sometimes recommend people trying when they're having problems with pacing mm. to find some out of copyright thing that they like and try how its pacing does it. Well, and I think sometimes people feel like, oh, borrowing from another thing is less good, it's less original. But often it's actually what gets us to do things that are, for us, more original because it gets us to do things we wouldn't think of doing. Yeah. So that, you know, when Shakespeare is adapting a real story, when we're writing historical fiction and we're trapped with the actual way people died uh, in what order and, and, you know, the king of France did hit his head on a doorframe and drop dead and you have to work with that narratively. (laughs) Whenever you're borrowing a thing that wasn't created by you, it gives you some things you wouldn't come up with, which then if you structure your things in and around them, broadens and increases the amount of originality vis-a-vis what you would come up with as opposed to decreasing the originality. I recently read this book called The Secret of Our Success, and it is a book about culture considered from an evolutionary perspective, which for me raised a whole bunch of hackles because of Evo Psych stuff, which is like, ugh. But I found much of the stuff in this book really interesting. The the catch is with any kind of social science research, I at this point have no idea whether any of it survived the great reproducibility crisis. So take everything here with a grain of salt. But the the sort of question that this book is asking, and I'm forgetting the author's name. Is the author Joseph Heinrich? That sounds right. Yes, Joseph Heinrich. Joseph Heinrich, Secret of Our Success. Okay. Yes, thank you. Uh, The question is, why are humans brought speaking, so successful in terms of, you know, reshaping our natural biomass, not necessarily in terms of long-term survivability or any of that kind of thing. But there's like a lot more of us than there are a lot of things that look vaguely like us. The postulate is human beings uh, considered sort of as a physical platform are not particularly all that much to write home about. We're pound for pound much weaker than, say, chimpanzees. We don't run as fast as a lot of things. We we're not as good at digesting a lot of stuff. And the counterpoint that gets often raised to say like, oh, why are humans so great? Is, ah, well, humans are much smarter. But this is the part that I'm not sure if it survived, but it's such a wonderful little result. When you put two-year-old humans in sort of things that we would recognize as intelligence, memory, and reaction time kind of tests, very, very simple ones against chimpanzees, the humans do tend to perform slightly better once they understand what the test is, but only like 5% better, not a commanding lead. What humans do seem to be very, very good at doing is learning from other humans, for, for good and ill. Like when you have a human child watching an adult human demonstrate a task. Say, I have this clear box that contains a reward, like a sticker or a chocolate. And I'm going to take a number of steps. I'm going to perform a ritual that opens this puzzle box. And some of the steps are not visibly essential to actually opening the puzzle box. Like I might stroke it three times, for example. And you show this to a human child and a chimpanzee. The chimpanzee will edit out the tasks that don't look initially essential and just do the things that open the box. The human child will repeat the entire process, including the stroking of the box, and will do it very quickly with less priming, um, with fewer repetitions. And there are a number of sort of results like this that seem to suggest that human beings are extremely good at learning from other human beings how to do things, even if the things that they're learning how to do don't have instant or particularly obvious causal relationships to one another, that we may not be particularly uh, runaway smart as a species, but what we're really good at is making sure things don't get lost. Efficiently packaging and passing on skills, techniques, processes, wisdom that we've learned in one generation into the next generation through all various forms of cultural transmission. And that we're quite optimized to do this. There are things about our brain development that prime us to receive certain kinds of cultural knowledge at certain stages that uh, 
uh, other primates just don't have, and that that has then had more of an effect on our bodies. Like we are not as good at detoxifying foods on average as basically any other any, any wild living animal because we've been living with food processing techniques, even very basic stuff like if you beat the greens, they are easier to digest. Like hit them with a stone, and then your body can process them the faster. So we've been able to shorten our intestines and give more of that space and calorie stuff to our brains. So, so this, I found this like very fascinating and I just love the notion that what we're trying to do is not so much invent everything original from the ground up, but to understand as much as we can what's come before us and then add to that or add our extra sort of layer of bricks to the top of the tower that we're all trying to build together. I mean, similar to what I say about how and why formulaic cozy mysteries work as a satisfying genre, because Mm -hmm. one of the things humans really enjoy is seeing a thing that you know is what is going to happen happen be completed with excellence and slight variation. Yeah. And in the same way that you find delight in watching a gymnast complete a prescribed routine or a prescribed move with excellence or uh, watching Swan Lake only gets this particular Swan Lake and it has these very slight variations, but it's still very similar to all the other Swan Lakes. Or, you know, how we get all of the suspects into the accusing parlor at the end of the cozy (laughs) mystery in order to then accuse them all sequentially and have all of their secrets come out. The fact that it's so similar is delightful and is one of the arenas which makes then the particular excellences of the small variations the more visible and the more delightful Mm. as you're getting to the end of a thing. There is a joy in trying a delicious dish you've never had before, but there is a different joy in having a burger and it's a standard burger and it has all the natural components of a burger and it's just uncommonly excellent and did a clever thing that other burgers hadn't done before. And much of the joy of having a new thing that you've never had before does consist in understanding how to have it or or sort of being primed for it. You know, your first experience with a new kind of food can be utterly delightful, but if you aren't ready for the kind of thing that it is, even if it's something that you love, it can be strange or off-putting. Like, let me give you a, let me give a specific example. Um, but I think I have a very concise yeah. Oh, example, go for it. Go just, for it. Run with it. Yeah. You know, a friend who dislikes eggplant because the first time the friend encountered eggplant yes. was in a mixed breaded fried things that all looked the same and the others had been chicken. Oh, no. <laughs> and then biting into this and expecting chicken and in fact, instead finding something mushy and unfamiliar, and it certainly tastes in a manner that one could imagine rotten chicken could taste. Yeah, uh, yeah. Ugh. Made a shockingly negative experience. Whereas if the person had been told, that's eggplant, <laughs> it would have been fine. When I was a child, I used to have a glass of water with me for reading before bed and, and until I'd get tired and fall over. And at one point, my mom, wanting to do something kind, had replaced the glass of water with a glass of Sprite, which I didn't usually get to have very very much or at all, or certainly not close to bedtime. And I took one sip of it and was like, is this poison? Am I being poisoned? Has something horrible happened to my water? What? And I went into the bathroom and poured it out. I couldn't recognize even this flavor that I would under some other context recognize and have a place for. Now, I think, I think in many ways what we were just reflecting on is a very good observation of the larger fact that I think there's a lot of anxiety about originality in people who want to create art, whether it's writing or other forms of art. And people worry whether they they don't have enough originality, whether they don't have enough ideas. I think in part, obsession with this question relates to how when people don't know what to ask an author, they ask, where do you get your ideas? Mm. You know, people worry about originality as if authenticity is harmed, if originality is somehow impure. But I think there is a lot of anxiety about authenticity and artistic realness somehow being compromised or it being a a sign that you're not a real writer or not a real whatever if you're borrowing and reusing material. And that that isn't a healthy way for us to think about the sharing and reuse and passing forward of materials. And I think a healthier way to think about it is like the objects in the prop room in the back of an improv theater of having received this 
squeaky goose and this hat and this scarf. And, you know, the last actor who was on the stage used this scarf to represent fire, but now I'm using this scarf to represent a river and someone else is using this scarf in another way. And, you know, we inherit formulae, we inherit the mystery and the clue and the red herring and the MacGuffin, and we inherit the formulae of tragedy and comedy, we inherit imagery, and we use those in new ways that are excellent in the same way that that improv performing group or that low budget Shakespeare group that is going to do Macbeth this week and did Comedy of Errors last week and has the same cardboard box full of objects. <laughs> Uh, is going to use them in new and innovative ways. And it's in no way a negative comment on the originality or authenticity or creativity of that troupe to use those tools. Uh, whether they use them in new ways or whether they say, you know, that scarf worked really well as fire. I'm going to do the fire scarf thing again, but I'm going to use it as a different fire in a different context, or I'm going to react to the fire in a different way. Just that that's a healthier way to think about it. I think it's interesting to think about this in the context of Tolkien's on fairy stories, where he's writing in defense of fairy stories at a time when they were considered to be only for children and nobody was taking them seriously in any way. And he wrote an academic defense of fairy stories. And in on fairy stories, he talks about the soup of story where things go into the soup of story and they might be historical things or they might be other stories and they cook in the soup and they come out in other forms. And when you write a story, very often you're taking a ladle out of the soup of story rather than making something new. And when you do make something entirely new, it goes into the soup of story and comes out in other forms. So you were talking about Conan Doyle talking about about how Holmes and Watson might live on in the afterlife of characters. Yeah, this is the thing Conan Doyle comments on in the introduction to memoirs of Sherlock Holmes, I think it is, uh, one of the later collections. And in a way, Holmes and Watson, who were, you know, very original, went into the soup of story and came out in all kinds of other forms. And the formulas of story, whether it's the formula of uh, there was a miller who had three sons, or whether it's the formula of the body in the library, mm -hmm. are in there to be pulled out like a fishbone that you can hang your own method on. And I, I very much like that concept. And the existing soup gives you the material to develop in an original direction. While I agree with you that Holmes and Watson are extremely original, there are trends of the, the, the like medieval fact-finding judge kind of stories, or even Solomon is in there somewhere. And, and the Holmes stories are often drawing, at least in my reading, off of gothic tropes. I think the soup metaphor is especially useful if we think of cooking things where you're using the soup as an ingredient, right? Yes. Right. It's not as if you passively receive the soup of stories and you take a scoop and your contribution is that you've got this bit it's you're you're about to make a casserole in which you need to use the broth from the soup to put as the liquid in which the other material is going to go it's or, the ramen broth of story yeah right you're making the mapo tofu you're making the ramen you're making the kanji that's going to have a broth over it you're making your own thing but you're also taking from this vat and putting it in and then the delicious juices that are left at the end of your pan when you've finished <laughs> frying your mapo <laughs> tofu or something those all go in and contribute to the complexity of the broth that everyone else is taking from. So that each unique creation is its own unique creation, but also has tools and structures that are left over that enter back in, rather than fully passive receipt. Cool. Well, why don't I just uh, jump in with our final fencing comparison? We can talk that a little bit. And sure. So the manner in which I often compare writing and fencing is... The process of learning them being slow and not spark of genius -y. So when we look at the Olympics, for example, there are, or when we look at something like math, there are math geniuses and there are music geniuses who just get it really are young and, and work on it and, and you know have masterful skill really quickly and in their teens or, or so on. Uh, and there are other skills that just don't do that. There are skills that are a slow apprenticeship, as it was once put to me, skills that are 
acquired slowly by learning it and practicing over a long period of time, which is no such thing as genius exploding you to the front or physical characteristics exploding you to the front. So when we look at the Olympics, for example, you have young medalists in swimming and you have young medalists in gymnastics and you have young medalists in a lot of sports where that person was really well built for it and worked really hard at it and boom, you know, very early with that vigor. Uh, And there are other fields like mathematics and sometimes some competitive games, uh, but often mathematics and music where you get youth geniuses. You just don't with fencing. The average age of the medalist at Olympic fencing is quite high for an Olympic sport because fencing is a slowly practiced, slowly mastered, incrementally gained skill. Another is driving. Hmm. Nobody is an instant driving genius. It was actually a fencing coach that compared these to each other for me, that you work on them and you get better at them by practicing them. And some people never practice them enough to be great and skilled at it and others do. But if someone is a great driver, it's because they've driven a lot. If somebody's a great fencer, it's because they fence a lot. And similarly, that writing is a slow apprenticeship. As this one fencing coach put it, put it to me, it really takes six years minimum to get really good at fencing if you're working hard at it and to get really good at driving if you're really hard at it. And it takes a long time, years of getting better at writing to be really great at writing. And I sometimes will talk to often someone who is college age, who is anxious and eager to be a writer and anxious about, oh, if I don't you know, get published by the time I'm 20 or by the time I'm 25, it hmm. means that I'm no good. It means that I don't have talent. And the answer is no. <laughs> this isn't a thing that has that. This is a thing that is a slowly gained, slowly honed skill and that most people who become excellent at it are going to you know, debut late because they worked hard. And people's work gets better and better as they practice more in a way that's very different from a lot of discussions of talent where a singer or a film star will often be a big, booming, you know, debut in their early 20s in a way a novelist just isn't. It does happen, but it's very rare. Yeah. And it's not a sign of failure that the skill comes slowly. It's a sign of normal that the skill comes slowly. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right there. And at least my limited experience has been, you do see tranches. There's a cluster of debuts often around the 28 to 32 or so mark uh, that loosely corresponds to the people who decided when they were 18, the thing that they wanted to do among all above all other things was write books for whatever reason. And then there's a tranche of debuts that are closer to like the early 40s that are people who maybe have had a lifelong interest and fascination and been working on it all this time, but have also gotten PhDs in other things and raised children and uh, started companies, done all this other stuff that also enriches and further develops their writing. And I I think that the waters can sometimes be a little muddied by the fact that in present day publishing, YA specifically really, I think, enjoys the media sensation of the extremely young debut author who is writing a YA book for, in theory anyway, a teenage to college age audience. That's definitely a marketing angle that gets pushed. And so I think that people may have an outsized impression of how important that age is to accomplishing something in the field. Or put another way, the only times we ever see the age of the author stressed is when it's a remarkably young debut. And the rest of the time, the age of the author will not be discussed. That's exactly it, yes. So, you know, whenever you hear about a debut author, they're always 22 because (laughs) otherwise they don't mention the age of the author. (laughs) Yeah, it's it's an interesting sampling bias there. I believe that I read relatively recently, but I can't remember where, that the average age of selling a first novel in science fiction and fantasy is 35. Hmm. And I was 36 when my first novel was published. So, you know, if you if you average us out, <laughs> it'll come out at 35. So I think it's far more often mid-30s, early mid-30s, rather than late 20s and early 30s. Fair enough. But it does change over time. 
And there are people, I mean, there's Christopher Paolini who published Aragon when he was 16. Mm -hmm. And recently in genre, Rebecca Quang, mm -hmm. yes. who emerged with the perfect zeitgeist book with the Poppy War, very young. So there are there are people who bring that average down. And the, the fact that there are people who bring it down means there are also other people who are debuting in their 40s and 50s who are bringing it back up again. Too. Exactly. And you run across them where they've taken longer than usual or, or as Max just said, they started companies and brought up families before they got to be practicing their craft sufficiently often that they got good. But generally, even taking into account the exceptions, it's not a straight out of the gate success field. It is definitely like fencing, a thing where you have to practice and practice and practice. Something I feel to be true, I'm curious as to whether you all would agree, is that in some ways that time before debut, before first publication is vital. <laughs> is like to be defended at all costs. Not that post-publication is the veil of tears exactly, but once your books are out there in the marketplace, they do on some level become a commodity and your publisher can relate to you in a vaguely commodifying way. There's a small, there's a pressure greater for some people, I think, than others. And some people feel it more than others, uh, which may not exactly correspond to those on whom it is the greatest to do something that is similar in vain to previous work or something that is identifiable as a particular type of book. And folks have a range of reactions to that from, you know, okay, great, fantastic. I'm going to write 16 of these to, ah, uh, nope, I'm going to go off in this other direction and then in this other direction after that. But the moment when you have not yet published anything, when you do not yet have sales figures or a you know narrative about your career to whatever extent, that is the moment where you can shape change to your heart's content. Now, it's counterbalanced because by, by not having as many readers, probably, likely, which, you know, you, that readers are one of the reasons, at least I do this, but it's a cool time and not, I think, to the extent possible to be regarded as something to be rushed through. Well, if you knew that it was for a time. Yes, that's very true. If you knew that you were going to succeed then it would be delightful. Yes. But as you don't know <laughs> until you have the validation of whether you are any good or not, or whether you're just a hopeless wannabe, mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. then, then it can be stressful. I have certainly seen examples where somebody will write a first novel that they've spent years, decades, thinking about and writing, and they come up with this brilliant, complex thing that may have first novel flaws, but also has a lot of energy and a lot of wonderful world building they've spent a lot of time, a wonderful plot that they've spent a lot of time on. And that first novel will be a success because it's brilliant. And then they're expected to bring out a second novel a year later or two years later. Mm -hmm. And they've only got two years to do their second novel and it'll be nothing like as good. And maybe they won't accept as much editing because they had a big success. I've seen that be a, a harmful pattern for people. Thanks for being patient, Tor. I really appreciate you letting me <laughs> spend an entire year writing one chapter. <laughs> but you also, so you had three novels ready when you sold your first novel. Yeah, because the first novel I sold was the fifth I started and the fourth I completed. But that's the fruit of working at it a long time and also not working on one project the whole time, but working on a project, completing it, sending it out, working on another one. Having practice, therefore, uh -huh. doing a project and then doing the next one, right? So I recently finished the last Terra Ignota book. I'm starting the first Hearthfire book. But it isn't my first time starting a new series after finishing a series. It's my... I guess it's my first time starting one after finishing one, but it's not my first time moving from working on a series to working on the next series. I've done that four times already from the pre Terra Ignota novels that I wrote but didn't publish. And you have practice ending individual books too, which is a huge skill that I think uh, gets under practiced in the giant sprawling series universe. Yes. Sure is. <laughs> when they introduced the best series, Hugo, I argued that it should be the best completed series because not only would that then be for a complete body of work, but also it would encourage people to finish things. It would be neat to have both actually. Actually, like best entry in a serial ongoing series for and best completing a series. 
because both of them are gorgeous and amazing art forms. The annual nature of the Hugos, I think, makes this a little complicated because when, I don't know, pity the person who happens to finish their deeply critically regarded trilogy or, or quadrology or whatever the same year that, I don't know, say Pat Rothfuss finally finishes The Doors of Stone or Martin comes out with the, you know, whatever. And then. We've seen, among others, beat. True. <laughs> That's a very good point. Um, yeah, uh, Saga of Ice and Fire book in uh, the regular novel one. So <laughs> especially if you had two, one for completed series and one for entry and ongoing series. Very good point. I think that both of those are great. And it's also why there's an ecosystem of awards and not only a Hugo. Yes. I like series, and I really do think the series are a different thing from a novel in the same way that a novel is a different thing from a short story. But also for that reason, they're hard to judge before they are finished. Max, we were looking recently, Joe and I together, at some of the reviews of volumes of Book of the New Sun oh, gosh. as it was coming out. You just had to have <laughs> absolute <laughs> abject trust in this thing. <laughs> <laughs> that it couldn't be this ornate or this complicated and this deep and not go anywhere. But what in the world it was going to was utterly incomprehensible. And, and you know, the, the reviews really were like that. They were just like, well, Gene Wolfe is a master of this genre and he's clearly doing something. Sure hope he sticks the landing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, but you, you just can't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, oh gosh. It's funny to think of reading Book of the New Sun as it came out, because for all of us, it's always all been there. Mm. Mm -hmm. But no, for, for Argus Budris, he really was having that experience of getting each volume to review as it came out. <laughs> This has been a great uh, and long and, and meandering and delightful conversation. And now, first, we'll all gush about a book that we have been excited by lately. And then finally, will be the administrative podcast stuff. But first, Max, where can listeners find more of your amazing stuff? You can find more of my amazing stuff at www.maxgladstone.com. That is my sort of home on the internet. I also have a Substack newsletter that has taken a lot of the energy that used to go towards blogs that I think is just maxgladstone.substack.com. And I am on Twitter at maxgladstone. Great. So, Joe, what is a book you have been excited about lately? Right now, the book that I'm reading in the bath is John Barnes' A Million Open Doors. I love A Million Open Doors. It is an absolutely wonderful book. It is science fiction. The backstory is that there were a bunch of planets who were settled by different cultures who went out from Earth, and they've been separated and developing separately, and now somebody has invented, like a Star Trek transporter that you could go from planet to planet, and they're opening up to each other and is causing cultural and economic issues, and it's got great characters and it's wonderful and there are three sequels which get progressively less and less focused and less and less about anything and as a series I do not like it and it does not fulfill its promise but I try to read the first book and forget about the others and I'm so enjoying reading A Million Open Doors at the speed of reading a chapter every morning when I have a bath. It's delightful, I stay in it so my fingers wrinkle up, I just want to read the book. It's so good, despite the whole not sticking the landing on a series point of view, because the volume sticks its landing. Max, do you have a book you're, you've been excited about lately? I have two. Can I, can I do two really quickly? Yeah, do two. Do two. Totally. All right. Uh, so I just finished a book called Rest by Alex Sujung Kim Pong, and it is a book about lives and habits of uh, creative and productive people through the last 200 years, focusing on the role of rest and recovery in maintaining continued production and like good creative life. And this is something that I have been really desperately interested in and utterly failing at for most of the last couple of years. I had a pretty stable <laughs> productive pattern before we had a kid, and I had a pattern in my life of kind of regarding rest as negative space, by which I don't mean I didn't think it was important, but I just thought, oh, it's the thing that will happen when no other things are happening. And that's totally failed me in the last year and a half because there's always been, there have always been things that need to happen. There's always food that needs to be prepared. There's always cleaning that needs to be done, childcare that needs to be done, and so on and so forth. So this book was really exciting and helpful for me in 
trying to figure out how to make rest and recovery like positive structural elements of my day. So that's been great. And I started a few days ago uh, Naomi Mitchison's To the Chapel Perilous. Oh. And it's tremendous. I haven't finished it. I don't know where it's going. It's the end of the Grail quest, and it looks like it's sort of rolling forward into the unwinding of the matter of Britain, told from the perspective of two very modern for Mitchison, so 1950s era reporters who are on the Grail and Camelot beats. Huh. And they have this amazing, like you can hear the mid-Atlantic accent sort of, like, or maybe that's just me having watched His Girl Friday too many times, but <laughs> like very sharp, beautiful, spare repartee with an enormous amount of wit and Mitchison handles gorgeously the import and weight of the grail and of the matters that are being treated on. You feel in the same breath the just utter humor of the fact that Dalen works for this figure who's introduced and referred to as Lord Horny and you're like, what, what is this? And it turns out that it's like literally Satan, like with the horns <laughs> and the tail lashing around and everything as his editor-in-chief. But also it's the Grail. And, you know, when Lancelot comes out with the Grail, it's Lancelot emerging from the Chapel Perilous with the Grail. And she masters this balance that I think of as the awe is not cheapened by the humor and the humor bites more deeply and is funnier and is sadder because of the awe. It's a really wonderful act, and I'm loving the book. So, Ada, what have you been reading? Well, what I've been reading is a chronological analysis of Danish Viking burial practices, volume three, which I don't necessarily recommend. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm really looking forward to the second volume of, so I can talk about the first volume of, uh, Dementia 21. Uh, this is a manga, I often end up recommending manga, this is a surrealist, grotesque, elder care horror comedy. Whoa. Whose heroine is a hired to do elder care in the home visity person. And in each different issue, there will be a different, over-the-top, horrific, but hilarious elder care situation that then escalates through surreality until it destroys the world. You know, the simplest example is the super high-tech dentures that turn out to take over your brain and then self-replicate and, and everyone is being turned into zombies by being taken over by, by mind-controlling dentures. Um, and there's another one which is they're dealing with a... It's the mother-in-law is the person who's being cared for. And the real problem isn't her needing care, it's her bullying her. She is bullying her son's wife because she is a persnickety mother-in-law. And, you know, the, the nurse is desperately trying to keep up to the standards of the mother-in-law. But no matter what she does, the mother-in-law is like, the room isn't clean enough. I can still see there's a tiny bit of dirt sticking out from underneath the light switch cover over there. Uh, and, the, and the girl is being driven mad by this. But then in swoops this, like, vigilante team of abused daughters-in-law uh. whose thing is... <laughs> saving you from cruel mothers-in-law and they'll like knock the mother-in-law out with a bear tranquilizer and then like a team of 20 people will scrub the room and she'll wake up and there's nothing to criticize and, and she can't handle it and and then the, the mother-in-law starts developing superpowers where she can look into your soul and see the interior dirt and then she becomes a 50 foot tall monster that rampages through the city finding politicians and accusing them of being filthy on the inside and, and it turns the Japanese political world upside down and you know, so <laughs> And there's another one which is truly astonishing where this company that is an elder care services company has developed these sealed capsules. It's like a container truck container and you put the elderly person in it and it has like a bed and a chair and a toilet and has everything they need and it has like the internet and, and food dispenses automatically and you like put them in this sealed capsule and then you just deposit them and never interact with them again and and one family has done this, but are now regretting it and, and want to find where their grandfather is. And so they hire her to go to the company to try to do it. The company takes her to where there are these giant towers of these stacked up containers. And she has to like climb them like a mountain climber. But they've all broken out their windows and created this elaborate 
interconnected society by running laundry lines between the different ones and like sending messages through and they've developed a political system and elected a president but now he's being tyrannical and and they're all like organizing a resistance movement and using their medications to create bombs which they send through the little laundry line dispensers with the little laundry hooks to like blow up each other's things and it's just amazing (laughs) And, and full of strange ingenuity, but also a kind of a delightful and humorous investigation into a sphere of human life that is huge, but that we don't ever like to depict. So I'm very excited to see what bizarre, over-the-top, complexly world-built elder care uh, humor horror is awaiting us in Volume 2 of Dementia 21. That sounds wonderful. I am excited to read this now. <laughs> So, this podcast is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial No Derivatives International 4.0 license. And you can support us and get episodes in advance at patreon.com slash Ada Palmer, and you can support Joe and get her wonderful poetry at patreon.com slash Blue Joe. And you can find us on Twitter and our books and things at joewaltonbooks.com and adapalmer.com. So, until next time, exurbe! Ad Astra. Ad Astra. Ad Astra.